But one of the things that she starts out with is, is a, a sort of dissection, a, an examination of what language does. And from her understanding what language does, we have a little insight into what the arts in general do, not just music. So here's what she suggests. And forgive me if this seems a little dense. I will do my best to make it clear. Uh, her suggestion is that our senses, our five senses, allow us to experience the world around us in a multi-dimensional way. You know, we smell, we taste, we feel, we touch. Oh, I guess that's the same thing, sorry. Uh, here, oh there, yes, here. That's good for music. Um, <clears throat> and the interesting thing is that the brain, apparently, is capable of discriminating specific objects and forms from what can be called a sort of field of sensory data. You with me so far? Okay. <laughs> okay. And the miracle of language seems to be that, on the one hand, that we learn to associate specific <coughs> objects in this field with words. As we learn words, one of the things that words help us do is to recognize in this array of things out there for us to experience, we begin to notice discrete objects. Think back a while, like when you were 12 months or something. It'll come back to you, I'm sure. <clears throat> the other thing that's interesting about language is that it allows us to recall these objects by means of an associated word. So the word allows us to recall the thing that the word is associated with. And the best part is, the thing itself doesn't have to be present. Now, we do this all the time. So it's hardly even noticeable or remarkable. But you think about it. We can talk about things, and the things that we're talking about don't have to be here. That's one of the miracles of, um, of language, is that ability to represent our experiences without the experiences having to be around us now. There are things that happened to us maybe in the past, and we can talk about them now. And even more interesting is that if other people have had similar experiences, they know the same vocabulary, the words that you use allow them to begin to understand what happened to you or what you're talking about because they have a similar set of experiences and a similar set of words or common language. So this concept could be called representation. That one of the things that words do is that they can represent experiences of real world objects and feelings and textures and sounds and whatever. They can, they can represent these things and through the representation, we can bring them to mind without them being present. And another interesting aspect about language is that it also allows us to recall attributes of these objects. In other words, because our senses are diverse and because the things that we experience are multidimensional. In other words, you know, when you talk about a, a tree, you're not talking just about the way the tree looks, but the tree has a texture, the tree has a color, or more many colors. Uh, it, uh, it has a height you know, and, and uh, dimensions and things like that. We experience all this stuff at once, but because of the way our mind works, we can actually pull these elements apart and talk about just attributes. We can talk about, for instance, the color of the tree independently of all the other things. So our mind is capable of of uh, recalling attributes separated entirely from the objects that have these attributes. Things like rough and smooth, hot and cold, tight, loose. These are attributes that can be discussed and thought about independently of the objects that have these attributes. Again, why is this interesting? This is a concept that could be called conceptualization. We are permitted through the miracle of language to actually conceive of qualities. We can think about them. And then the last thing I'd just say about language is that because of this ability to remove or separate one attribute of an experience and compare that attribute to the attribute of other experiences and to compare them and to put them into categories, Suzanne Langer calls this process abstraction. That we have the ability to abstract qualities of experiences and to put those qualities together in such a way that we can think about the nature of the quality of the experience, again, independently from the objects that have those attributes or qualities. Or in short, you know, language gives us 
the remarkable capacity to think about our experiences. It gives us a means to think about them without those objects having to be present. We can hold in mind these qualities through some kind of symbolism. And this allows the qualities to be present before the mind's eye. Well, this process, or this three-part process, you could call it representation, conceptualization, and abstraction, Langer thinks this is the basis for a really powerful theory about art. Art with a capital A, big art. And um, she suggests that, well, what's going on? What's being abstracted? What's being you know, expressed in these works of arts? works of art. Her suggestion is that one of the things that, that uh, um, first of all, one of the things that um, the human mind is capable of is the representation of these qualities, and she suggests that the qualities themselves that art seems to be interested in is what she calls the life of feeling. How life experiences feel or make us feel. Her suggestion is that that is one of the things that the arts are trying to address. And anything that can be perceived can be expressed by us with our symbol-making brains. We make symbols all the time. We use materials to create objects that express this perception that we have about how life feels. And uh, she goes on to say that, in her mind, the artist is basically expressing, in a way, not so much specific experiences or specific feelings, but what the artist knows about how life feels. It's expressing a kind of knowledge or, or insight into it. And she calls this, this uh, expressive dimension of artworks an expressive form. She even at one point calls it an apparition, which I think is a great term. Yeah. And uh, one of the things about this apparition, this, this uh, expressive form of the way life feels, is that it is um, something presented only for perception. Uh, she, says, she makes the analogy at one point that, uh, in a way, it's like if you imagine a rainbow. A rainbow is something that has no substance, but you can perceive it. The expressive form of artworks is like that rainbow. It's something that you either perceive or you don't. But language can't help you. She would suggest that it cannot be, this expressive form, it can't be pointed out. It can't be explicated with words. Uh, in fact, language can't even indicate it or paraphrase it. The expressive form is in the work of art. It's there. You either see it, you perceive it, or you don't. You can demonstrate the uh, ingredients of a work of art, but you can't demonstrate the expressive form itself. <laughs> and if we assume that any of the above of what I said is true, then what is art for? <laughs> well, if we can accept the idea that the human mind in is indeed capable of giving expression to the qualities of our own existence, to the, to the way that life feels for us. If we can take materials and shape them, mold them, manipulate them into some kind of uh, form that is symbolic of human feeling, you know, the tensions, the resolutions that we feel, the, the, the ebb and flow of energies, I'm just quoting her now, uh, the stress and pull of life events. If we can assume that some kind of uh, material can be molded or shaped into things that are expressive of these, these, uh, these feelings, um, then her suggestion is that some media are um, perhaps better suited to give expression to certain qualities. What she calls the plastic arts, okay, by which she means painting, sculpture. Her suggestion is that one of the things that the plastic arts do is that they give um, the dimension of space. The dimension of space, she says, they give it a kind of a, a, a location. In other words, space, generally speaking for us, is something that is without dimension. Space is something that is in need, as far as we humans are concerned, it's in need of having 
being given limitations and dimensions. And for instance, one of the things that we humans do is we move objects, we arrange objects, or we construct objects with which we limit or define space. This is kind of what buildings do, in a sense. I mean, sure, they offer a shelter, but one of the things that they do is they take what would otherwise be an, uh, an open and un, um, undifferentiated space, and they create spaces, so to speak, within space. Spaces within space. 